nice concept that I heard of uh, and read about is that it is like the visual art, the arabesque. When you look at the visual arts of the Arabs, you see that there are no ornaments, there are no uh, natural uh, uh, images from mm. nature. Like there is no. I'm so glad to bring you this conversation with somebody that I've wanted to have on the podcast for a long time. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations. And when I saw that Haggai Belitsky was going to be at Luca at the base Congress, the European Base Congress this summer. I just had to find time to sit down with him and chat. I've been meaning to have him on for years. I think it's so interesting what he does. And what he does, which we get into here, is explores the world of Middle Eastern music on the base. It was super cool. I got a chance to see his session in Luca and see him uh, experiment with quarter tones, or as we get into three quarter tones. The guy talks about that and much more, and how he interacts. Uh, with with all these different forms there's so much great information here and you definitely have to check out his website double bass east and i have that all spelled out but double bass and then east.com Hagai is really blazing new musical paths and just doing such beautiful work in israel so Thank you, Haggai, for chatting. It was so great, and we definitely have to do it again soon. We just scratched the surface of what the two of us could be talking about. Quick shout-out to our sponsors, Diderio Strings, Colstein, Robertson & Sons, and Upton Bass. More on them later in this conversation, but it's my pleasure to bring you this talk with Haggai Belitsky. A guy, so great to, so great to <laughs> finally chat with you. So we're sitting here in uh, Luca, Italy. Yes. And a guy just played today at demonstrating uh, Middle Eastern bass, uh, which which you've been doing for years. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe an interesting place to start would be just like, how did you get into Arabic music and playing it on the bass? Well, I. Uh... I had to come back from New York when I did for three years mm -hmm. and playing jazz. And I had to come back because of uh, family reasons. Sure. And back in Israel, I really had a, like a musical crisis. I could not uh, play jazz uh, in the same way. Uh, and uh, I, had, I was very lucky to meet a, an oud player, mm -hmm. master, the name Nino Beaton in Jerusalem. Okay. And uh, all my friends were playing with him and they told me, yeah, come on, check it out. And I went over to his place and uh, we played and uh, he was like, okay, the next the day after tomorrow, there's a concert, you know, we play. So I didn't come to that concert, but ever since I, I came almost every day to his place and we're just learning, playing music together and... Uh, this is how I got into it, and uh, he's he's playing uh, North African music, okay. which is a branch of the Arabic music that uh, does not have uh, quarter tones. So it was uh, the quarter tones, like the microtonality. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was easy for me to start there. It is a good starting point. Uh, Moroccan music, Algerian music, and uh, then it was my teacher Michael Klingofer that told me if you're doing this music. Why don't you come to the Jerusalem Academy, where I studied with him before I went to New York? And uh, why don't you come to the Middle Eastern department and study Arabic music? That, that is the music. This is with the with the quarter tones and everything. Yeah. And then I checked it out and I said okay. And uh, there started uh, six years like uh, 
first bachelor and master's degree in Arabic music in Middle Eastern uh, music and uh, it was amazing you know to find the way for for myself yeah. because my teacher was a, a violin player and an oud player Taisir Elias and uh, he's, he's not a bass player and uh, he told me once that he, he went to Michael to Klinghoffer and asked him he's, he's doing this he's playing that is that okay that he's playing like this and Michael told him he can play with his arm around his, uh, his, his <laughs> ear if it sounds good it's okay so that gave me the green light for uh, experimenting with uh, how you can uh, execute microtonality in the way that that the Arabic music uses it on the bass and really yeah use it like a, like an eastern instrument yeah and it's really interesting I, and I'll make sure that we link up to your website and some videos so people can see this and actually it was really cool to see you just now going through and demonstrating these different techniques and one thing that struck me is just talking about quarter tones in general you were describing three quarter tones and how that's really what you're using when you're playing Middle Eastern music, right? Can you can you describe what that? Because I think people think quarter tones, and they they think like going from E up to E half, half sharp and back. Like, how do quarter tones or three quarter tones work? Um, yeah. I will try to explain. Uh, we we still have seven notes in a scale, mm -hmm. so there is only one type of each note. One if if the scale is from C to C, so there there is only one type of C, one type of D, one type of E. So if the E is half flat, that means it is not flat, it is only half flat. It's between the E flat and the E natural. So mm -hmm. it's one quarter tone from E flat. But you don't have E flat in the scale, you have a D. Yeah. And an F, like D, E half flat, F. So this is uh, this are three quarter of a tone between D and E half flat. And another three quarter between, quarter between E half flat and F. So this is why it is actually three quarter interval. Okay. So the, the, the scale C, D, E half flat, F would be one tone, one whole tone between C and D. Three quarter to E half flat, three quarter to F. Well, and then when you're playing that three-quarter tone, you were demonstrating in different different uh, circumstances, like that the 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 three-quarter tone would sometimes be a little bit sharper or flatter, right? Which kind of gives it like almost like a major quality to a minor quality. Can you talk about that and how how that works? It, easier to demonstrate, but maybe yeah, it just yeah. yeah yeah you're right. It is hard to to try to explain without without listening to it because yeah. what you just heard it and it was clear, right? Yeah. Because it, it is a. I just I will explain that I, I was playing E half flat in some makam, which is the scale. In some makamat, it is a little higher. In some makamat, it is a little lower. The same E mm -hmm. half flat, and yes, between E and E half flat, there is a difference. But this is this is one of the things that yeah, it is hard to to get uh, at the beginning. <laughs> But, uh, yeah. This episode is brought to you by the good folks at Upton Bass String Instrument Company. Eric and Gary and the whole Upton team, I can't say enough good things about them. And they have been on board with the various endeavors I've done online from the start. They were one of the early sponsors of the blog back in 2006 and 2007. And it has been so fun to follow along with their journey and see them develop these new models of basses like the car bass, the Bostonian, the Bohemian. Bohemian and to connect with all these amazing players. I've had the privilege of speaking with so many people that play Upton Basses from Eric Rivas of Branford Marcellus's band and Lucia Torino of The Devil Makes Three, all the way over to Anthony Mons of the New Century Chamber Orchestra and Kevin Smith, Willie Nelson's bass player. I've had many students purchase Upton basses over the years. I've had a lot of colleagues play Upton basses. I see them on gigs all the time. They play great and Upton stands behind their work. Can't recommend them highly enough. Check them out online at uptonbass.com. As I think 
over the years, how many times I've used Colstein products. It's just amazing. I look at my base right now, which has on the same bib that I bought while in high school. That's a Colstein's bib. I can't believe that this thing is still kicking, but I have my pencils and my rosin and all those other accessories in my bib. And when I look inside my bib, I see my Colstein rosin, which Peter Lloyd and so many other bass players use. I enjoy their ultra rosin. And I have my Colsey instrument cleaner that I've used for years and years to keep my bass looking good and clean. They've got Veracore strings, which Michael Klinghoffer loves to use, especially on student bases. They've got quivers, stands, so much more. Learn more about their accessories, their beautiful pedigree instruments, and so much more at Colstein.com. Uh, uh, we're listening at a, a horse just <laughs> rode by us, and which is actually interesting because uh, Haggai used a, a, an illustration of right. a horse in, in the, the, the handout uh, today and, and describing the uh, – in terms of ornamentation and how, like, it's not the, – the ornamentation – is the music right? Am I? I'm kind of paraphrasing. Yeah. Can you talk about that? How, how ornamentation works? Uh, in, in, and yeah, it, yeah, this was one of the things that were uh, eye-opening to me when I started listening or when I started learning this music. That uh, a lot, of, maybe uh, a lot like Baroque music, it has to be ornamented. You cannot, if you're playing a note or the, the wrong ornament. You, it's like playing the wrong note. If you don't play an ornament, you, it's like playing the wrong note. You mm -hmm. have to ornament. And uh, in Arabic music, uh, a nice concept that I heard of uh, and read about is that it is like the visual art, the arabesque. When you look at the visual arts of the Arabs, you see that there are no ornaments. There are no uh, natural... Um, uh, images from mm. nature like there is no they don't uh, it, it is all ornamentations yeah all different kind of uh, graphic uh, designs and uh, this graphic design is a time art like music because it takes you the design takes your eye you first see this and then you see that and this is why they make it like this the design so the music is it's really pretty much like this. Different ornaments that are put together to create something. And rather than a melody that is ornamented. I don't yeah. know if that's... Yeah, no, no, it makes sense. No, it makes sense. So, so you're not seeing like an... There's not like an, an image of like a, a castle or something. It's right. the orna So it's more kind of abstract or, or right. ornamental. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is... Another thing that, that you were talking about that struck me is just the concept of harmony, or maybe not harmony, in right. in in Arabic music. How how does that kind of thing? We live in this. Most of us probably listening live in this Western culture with twelve equal temper tones and G major, D right. minor, and that sort of thing. How how do Middle Eastern musicians think of melody and harmony when they're when they're playing well for me as a jazz as a jazz player it yeah. was really really interesting to be able to play without changes like, <laughs> right. like I'm sure. okay, all my life like I, if it was a vamp you know just vamp going on I didn't know what to do and this just gives you the, th the solution what what do you do with with no harmony or with just one sound that you have to play on and uh, it's inter interesting to see see the, the you know the, the the concept that there is a system of notes that have a have a way to go from one to another yeah. and to get to a, some kind of a direction to get to climax and and to go back and to get to get to a conclusion and to come back um, yes this music does not have harmony so it is also a challenge for us as bass players to to accompany it mm -hmm. because most of the time well you heard me play solo a lot and right. and play the with the bow but most of the time like 90 percent of the time I, I i'm a bass player in an ensemble of arabic music and the bass was uh added into arabic music back in the 1920s and uh the all the great arab orchestras 
of the 20th century has a double bass in there mm -hmm. and um, its role is, is very very interesting because it's not harmony it has to play the same notes as the general unison and has to be with the rhythm with the percussion mm -hmm. uh, to play the so it's it's fascinating to me to to try and uh, it, it, it is also very, very you're very free to, to to take it however you want because there are a few concepts well something you did you didn't dig into today in your session is just rhythm in Arabic music like how how uh, well, what's what what might be surprising to those of us that play you know classical or jazz music is in terms of how uh, people playing that think of rhythm um, Again, what surprised me when I when I first started is that uh, in Western music we have uh, two kinds of beats. We have uh, strong beats and we have we have we have the weak beats. We never have two strong beats one after the other, and every every bar has a, has one strong beat. Or even if it's two, they're not uh, one after the other. And in Arabic music, the the it is. It can also be one after the other, but not only that, it has three kinds of beats. And this is, um, this is something we, I find uh, all the time, that in Western music there are two. It's a binary kind of thing, like you have major, you have minor, you have uh, semitone, you have whole tone. Right. But in the East, you have a variety. You have a lot more than two kinds of seconds. Not only it's just semitone and whole tone, you have in between, and you have uh, for rhythm you have three kinds of beats. So you have the doom, that's the heavy. You have the tuck, and you have the s. So with three kinds of beats, you have, you can make a lot more uh, different uh, like like rhythmic modes, mm -hmm. which is a borrow, borrowed uh, 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 term from uh, Western music also, but. Uh, uh, I think it helps to call it like this because uh, you, you can just create, like you create makamat, you can create rhythms that are more complex. And yeah, interesting. Mm. This episode is brought to you by D'Addario Strings. Our friends at D'Addario want to help listeners change their strings safely and efficiently, and they have a few tricks to help you achieve that. Here's a great tip. Change your strings two at a time, removing them from the inside out, then replacing them from the outside in allows for easy access to the lower pegs, ensuring strings lay neatly in the peg box. Learn more at orchestral.dedario.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by Robertson and Sons Violins. For more than 40 years, over four decades, Robertson and Sons has specialized in providing the highest quality string instruments and bows to collectors, professional musicians, music educators, and students of all ages. Their modern facility, which is totally beautiful, by the way, if you're ever able to make it out to Albuquerque, New Mexico, I highly recommend it. They have a recital hall that they use not only for performances, but it's a Available to their clients. So if you want to try out a fine pedigree base or even a student base or anything in between, you can go in that recital hall. I've had the chance to do that. Totally amazing. I'm like a kid in the candy store when I'm down there at Robertson's. Check them out online at robertsonsviolins.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. Do, do you think... Uh S spending all this time that you have in this world uh, of Arabic music, d has that changed the way you think about playing other styles of music? Like if you were going to uh, walk a bass line in a jazz context or play a classical solo, do you think, do you think that your experience in these groups or playing these different tone, uh, um, quarter, three-quarter tones or, or just these, has that changed the way you approach other styles of music at all? Has it opened your eyes in any ways? Um. I think I think it it uh, had made me a, a lot better player <laughs> because <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure why, but I mean, just dealing with uh, with executing something that you know, I, I think st style in music is something you, that you have to connect to, 
there is no there is no music with without style yeah. I think uh, and you cannot study music without studying a style and really getting heavily into the style and then after you know a style you can you can open your eyes to other stuff other styles and learn them easily easier mm-hmm. more easily after you know a style and you know what is unique about a style what makes a style unique and so this is this is the the big thing because for a lot of students that I teach um, just finding a style that is uh, I mean some of the students are not uh, are not cl- not classical players you see that they will not be classical players and some of them don't like the the language of jazz and sure. are not willing to sit and transcribe all day bebop and but it, this also gives them a, a, mu- a musical direction that they they can go to and still enjoy all the you know all the all the things the instrument has to to offer technically and uh, But I think more than that to your question in this music there is the East, Eastern music in general there is a more um, focus on the moment in Western music it's about the piece about getting about directionality and about a superstructure that goes from here to there in Eastern music you will not find a form like a sonata form that is very complex and highly you You, but you will find very very complex things that are in the me- in the moment like mm-hmm. those rhythms or the makamat or the really really small uh, intonations and uh, it's like comparing poetry and literature like mm-hmm. uh, so it's really a lot of uh, focusing in the min- in the moment which is great to do even yeah. when you play classical music or jazz it is good to have this uh, this kind of uh, involvement you know yeah. in the playing if, if somebody people are listening all over the place you know to, to this um, if we're let's just say we're talking to somebody in Iowa not to pick on Iowa but example you know so like like they There might be some some Arabic music happening in Iowa I'm not sure but mm-hmm. but probably not as much as as where you live uh, if, if somebody's out there and 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 is interested in what we're talking about like is there any place in online I mean, they should definitely check out your website yeah but any any recordings any YouTube videos anything you'd point people to just to get a sense of what what it's like to um, to play this kind of music either double bass related or otherwise this is the most uh, frequently asked question how, I'm how sure do I, how I'm do sure. I begin <laughs> yeah uh, uh, I tried to answer that in the website I, I made a page that is called it was originally for an ISB convention mm-hmm. that I was attending so it is double basis which is the, yeah. the, the, the slash ISB okay if you write this you get to a YouTube gallery okay with stuff to start with there we go yeah so you cannot find a lot of things theoretical about this music online. Not too much, and this is part of the difference between East and West in mm-hmm. the, East, the at least in Arabic music the, 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 the gap between theory and practice is so so big because practice is some theory is just something that people try to think about right. afterwards right. to explain the, the, the practice and in the West it's almost almost the opposite right well it's like you said today you were playing through some examples that you had written down and you said like nobody would actually write this down like this right yeah like yeah, that but right. but absolutely that's what would happen in Western classical music right you play everything that's on the page uh, yeah yeah uh. yeah like I said if you play classical classical music in classical music if you don't play exactly what is on the page you're wrong in Arabic music if you play exactly what's on the page you're wrong you have to play you Otherwise you have to understand the music and play the ornaments and the right intonation everything is yeah yeah it's yeah. different in this way well I, I I appreciate what you do I think it's really cool I, this is long overdue so it's great to sit down and chat and we got to do it again sometimes soon uh, but uh, and I usually I usually ask 
some advice for your younger self type of question. Uh-huh. And I know you were a jazz player and then went to New York. So you could pick the age, whether it's 18-year-old, a guy, 22-year-old, or whatever, but some younger version of yourself. What would you tell them now, doing what you're doing, teaching where you're teaching, exploring the music you're exploring? What advice would you give your younger self? I, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's an advice I would give, but it's some uh, insight that I remember having, and uh, I wish I could... Uh, uh, get to it earlier is just take care of your of your business of yourself and don't think about other stuff you know just do what what you know you 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 should do and be you know just to be ready for for whatever comes when it comes just keep keep on you know on your game yeah well, double B, double base east dot com, yeah. right? I'll link up to that. But hi, guy, great to great to hang out in person and chat, and let's do it again soon. That's amazing, Jason. Thank hey. you so much. Hi, guy, thank you so much for chatting, folks. DoubleBaseEast.com is his website, and you can learn all about what he's doing. And he's such a giving person, so giving of his time and his energy and his knowledge. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, reach out to him. I'm sure he'd love to start a dialogue. So much great music at Luca, at Base Europe. I get so inspired going to these events. And if you have any way of getting to an event, either like Base Europe, which is happening in uh, uh, even numbered years, 2014, 2016, 2018, or the International Society of Bases Convention, ISB, which is happening in odd numbered years, and will be coming up. 2019 in Bloomington, Indiana, Indiana University. You got to go to these events. I get so much out of them. I come back rejuvenated, inspired, just raring to go with new ideas and new concepts. And you get to see old friends and make new ones. And I can't say enough good things about events like this. And the opportunity to have conversations like this with somebody like Hagai. You might not have a podcast and be putting that conversation out, but you too will be having these sort of inspiring conversations if you go to ISB or Base Europe or another event like that. So check it out. And again, thanks, Hagai, for sitting down and chatting. Controversy Conversations is produced by Steve Hinchy, Michael Cooper, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. Mitch is making beautiful bases in the Dallas area. Such a great guy and a talented luthier. Look him up online at mitchmooring.com. Krista Copper is our archivalist, is that the correct word, going through and cataloging all the topics that we cover in these numerous conversations and helping to bring into focus things that we can pull together into highlight episodes or topic-specific episodes. Such a big help, and thank you so much to Krista and the rest of the team. I'm Jason Heath, your host, coming to you live, for well, sort of live, <laughs> here in San Francisco, California, where we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.